Thanks for listening to Church of the Open Door Sermons Podcast. Church of the Open Door is based out of York, Pennsylvania, and we exist to help everyone discover life changed through Jesus. For more information about Church of the Open Door or for locations and service times, be sure to visit us at codyork.org. Thanks again so much for listening. Good morning. Hey, great to see you and happy Thanksgiving to you since I didn't see you before Thanksgiving, most of you. I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. I trust that you are not in a food coma this morning, but that you're with me. Stay with me. Anybody have any food babies today? Did you ever hear that? Food baby? You ate too much? Well, it's good to see you. I want to welcome you. Welcome those who may see this via video online or, or even here in the next couple of services. I'm going to run out to East York this morning and spend time with those folks. So uh, we're just glad to be able to uh, gather together and to worship together. I love when we get together on Sunday mornings and collectively worship the Lord together. There's something special about that. I led worship here for 20 years on this campus. And uh, there's just nothing like a group of people coming together, collectively worshiping the Lord. And you can sing and worship God in your shower and in your car, and that's all great. But there's something unique and powerful about the body coming together. There's also something quite powerful about a single decision or a single person who has an effect upon us. Think of, for me for a moment about the power of one bullet. There are hunters many of them missing here this morning, who are going out into those woods hoping to shoot that trophy buck with just one shot, one bullet. Many of them will need to take three or four, but hopefully just one bullet. I tried that once, and I shot a doe with two miles up the mountain, had to drag it two miles to the pickup truck, and I couldn't figure out why is this fun, and uh, just never really caught on to that. But anyway, the power of one question Will you marry me? Maybe the power of the answer, right? Yes or no. The power of one mistake. Sometimes it takes years, if not a lifetime, to recover from that one mistake. The power of one decision. When I was in high school, I had set out to be an architectural engineer. I was already accepted into college. I was ready to go. I loved drafting and that kind of work. And I made a decision. I was going to attend Bible college first for one year. And that decision totally changed the trajectory of my life and what I'm, what I'm doing today. The power of one man and one woman. Think of Thomas Edison for a minute. In his lifetime, he acquired 1,093 1, patents. Vented the light bulb and the record player and many, many other things, right, that have totally affected us even to this day. We sit here under lights because of Thomas Edison Somebody like Queen Esther, the right woman at the right time, was able to save the Jewish people from Xerxes' decree to destroy them. These are people who single-handedly affected humanity for good. And of course, there are those examples of those who single-handedly affected humanity for evil, such as Adolf Hitler, just to name one. So a person can invent and create. Another person can destroy One person can speak life into another person, and another can speak death with their words. There's power in one person to heal, and then there's power in one person yet to kill. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, we're going to land here this morning, if you'll turn there with me and your copy of the Word of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 21, we're finishing up this section, Romans 2, our section 2 of death to life. Paul is clearly demonstrating for us the power of one. And he outlines for us the great contrast between Adam and Jesus. It's a passage of comparison. And we all compare based upon our own biases of what we think is better, right? So a little audience participation here, just as Brett did earlier, you know, ham or turkey. Here we go. Coke versus Pepsi. All right. Chevy versus Ford. Well, we got a Ford people in here. Fix or repair daily, and you guys are on it. All right. Beach versus the mountains. All right, good. Uh, Mac versus PC. Yeah, y'all are hedging on that one. Apple versus Android, right? Republican versus... De- no, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand on that one. Today we're going to see a contrast that Paul gives us of two different beginnings, two roads, two destinations. The first Adam 
Adam, historical Adam, and the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Paul refers to these two Adams in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's talking about what our bodies will be like after the resurrection and the origins of these two Adams. And he says this, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, the first Adam, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. So Romans chapter five, Paul's lying, laying out for us the contrast of what one man did and how it affected everything against what another man did and how it affected everything. And as we, we begin to read this paragraph together, I want us to just be looking or looking out for three words or phrases that come up a number of times. The first one is the word one, O-N-E. It's found like 11 times in this passage. The power of one. Through one man, Adam, came one sin, one choice, one path that was chosen that brought about one result, condemnation. And then he's gonna talk about the one man, Jesus, who through one sacrifice, one right choice that opened the door to salvation. Both Adam and Christ is something that one man did in order to affect the whole. The second word that we'll see a number of times is the word reign, R-E-I-G-N. Something like five times here. Paul will show us that these two men reign over their own kingdoms. Adam reigns over the kingdom of death. Jesus reigns over the kingdom of life. From Adam flows streams of destruction from his kingdom, and from Jesus flows streams of life. And then finally, you'll find a couple of times in this passage the phrase, much more, overflowing. And Paul points out to us as we read it that the one man, Jesus, and his impact was much more, so much greater than the impact that Adam had upon us, even though his impact was really, really great and really amazing, not in a good way. The big idea, if you want to have it for this section, you want to write something down here, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We talked, we talked about it just earlier, quoted it. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ will all be made alive. That's the, that's the big idea of Romans chapter five, verses 12 to 21. Two points for you today that I want us to think about. I want you to write them down because you might forget them. They're tough ones, I'm telling you. They're tough ones. Two responses, really, since it's Thanksgiving. These are not points of theology or homiletical points. These are responsive points to what it is that we're reading. The first point will be this. Thanks a lot, Adam. With a little, you know, frowny emoji next to it. Thanks a lot, Adam. Way to go, man. And the second point is very similar. Thanks a lot, Jesus. Thanks a lot, Jesus. Those are two points. That's pretty simple. You better write them down, though. They're kind of hard to remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. Let's read verse 12 to 14 together. He says this, Therefore... Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam did, because there was no command there was no law who, Adam, was a pattern of the one to come. Thanks a lot, Adam. Way to go, man. You know, Paul begins a section with therefore, basically saying, you know, all the things that Paul said up to this point, how he's been talking to us about, about the, the destruction in our lives, all the stuff about depravity and sin and death. How did this all happen? How did we get in to such a mess? And Paul, I think, is explaining it here. And I've been around for a little while, and I can remember, I, I think to this day, I think, you know, it just seems worse than it used to be, right? I think things are just worse than they used to be. And you know what? I bet my dad says, when he was growing up, I bet he thought, you know, when I was a kid, it was, we thought that was pretty good. But he was probably thinking, you know, things just seem worse than it used to be. And my grandparents probably, when they grew up, thought to themselves, you know, things just seem worse than they used to be. 
Sin just seems to be kind of getting worse in some way. You know, life's gotten a lot worse since I was a kid. Even Solomon tells us here in, in his scriptures that there's nothing new under the sun, right? There's nothing new. So what's going on? I do think there's a progression of sin or a progression of the acceptance of sin that we see in our world as generation passes. And when we were kids, things were different. But the heart of man was still the same and has been ever since Adam's sin. This world is a mess. And we ask ourselves, whose fault is it? And the media would like to tell us it's the Democrats for it, depending on who you, what channel you turn on. If it's another channel, they'll say it's the Republicans' fault, or it's Biden's fault, or it's Trump's fault, or it's Russia's fault, or it's China's fault. No, the Bible's clear here. It's Adam's fault. It's Adam's fault. Adam opened the door. Sin entered the world through one man, Adam. He says right here. Now, we talk about this sometimes. We say, man, when I get to heaven, I can't wait to talk to Moses and Elijah and, and, uh, and uh, Jeremiah and just, you know, see if he stopped crying yet. And, and I just want to talk. Nobody says I want to talk to Adam. You know, I want to take Adam out behind the barn, you know? I want to talk to Adam. What in the world was that all about? What happened? I just want to take him out and deck him. His one choice. His mistake, one self-serving decision brought about destruction, crime, depression, murder, addiction. Man, I hate that one. On and on and on to the entire human existence from that day until right now. Adam had a choice which turned out to be a very powerful choice. The power of one decision. We'll see later that we have a choice to make in this dilemma, we have a choice to make that we're facing in this dilemma. It's a powerful tool that we have to change our situation. We'll talk about it in a little bit. I have a sweet, sweet, wonderful, mostly perfect grandson named Roman, of all things. He's named Roman. When Roman's mama asks Roman to do something, and sometimes he'll say no, that's a very powerful choice that that little three-year-old has when he's making that decision. He's using his volition and his will to decide against obeying his mother. And now my almost perfect little grandson will then meet a very powerful choice that his mother has. And he'll find himself in a bit of trouble, right? Adam was given a choice in the garden. He had a simple command to follow and he chose to do the opposite of God's directive. It really shouldn't have been that difficult, right? One tree, don't touch. It's, that's it. That's it. Everything else is yours. One tree, don't touch. It's that simple. But we get it, don't we? Pastor Rob talked about it last week. We see the sign, wet paint. What do we do? Is it really wet? It's shiny, but I don't think it's wet. Don't walk on the grass. You know, we keep going. What is it about us that just has to have that contrarian way about us? You say, well, well, if it's true that Adam made the decision, that one tree, don't touch, that's it, and Adam messed up, it's his fault, he blew it, why in the world am I in trouble then? Why am I in trouble? I don't know him from Adam. I don't even like fruit, right? Why is it my fault? How did it become my problem? It's very important to understand it. It's seen out in this passage of scripture in Romans 5. Adam's sin was passed on to all men. He started it, but we kept it going. He started it, but we kept it kept it going. Romans chapter three, it says, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We are without excuse. And in verse 13 here, it says, we didn't even need the law in order to break it. We are already born into this sin nature and we will sin. You don't need to know the rules in order to break them. There's a standard set up by the Pennsylvania Department of Transformation on some streets in our county, and the standard is 25 miles per hour. And I'm not sure why all of my illustrations continue to go back to traffic violations as illustrations, but I guess you go with what you're familiar with. <laughs> and if I'm driving in an unfamiliar area, I may not know that the speed limit is 25 miles per hour, but I can still get stopped by a police officer, pay a fine because I broke the law, even though I didn't know that that particular street, that that was the law. 
And Paul shows us here and shows us later that it's even worse when we do know the law. Don't you love it when the police officer does come to your window? Sir, do you know how fast you were going? I don't know. Fast, I guess. Do you realize that this is a 25 mile an hour speed limit? Uh, no, I didn't know that, sir. Well, it's unfortunate. You still get a ticket, right? Doesn't matter if you know it or not, you broke the law. Paul's telling us here that because of Adam, humanity has been infected with a disease. We've been infected with a disease. And because of that infection, we will all die. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though he didn't break a command that they knew about. They didn't know about the Ten Commandments. There were no such things at the time. They still broke the righteousness and the holiness of God. Death reigned from the time of Adam. He was the first doctor death, and he passed it on to all of us. It all started there. Notice the progression. Notice the progression in verse 12. Sin entered the world. Sin entered Death came because of sin. Death spread. Death came to all men. See that? And then later, death reigned. Sin entered. Death came. Death spread. Death reigned. One man's act was so devastating, it's affected all of us to this very moment. He was our representative. He passed on that character flaw onto the rest of us. Again, how does that work? I wasn't there. How can God accuse me or hold me accountable for a flaw that was passed on to me through my parents and grandparents? I don't understand. Well, this principle is seen in other ways. Do you have your mama's eyes? Do you have your dad's nose or your grandpa's mouth? Those characteristics are passed on through our physical propagation. And the sin nature in the same way, it's passed on to all of us through the spiritual nature that we all acquire at birth. It's in our spiritual genetics, if you will. And as we said back when we looked at Romans chapter one, that's the reason the virgin birth is so, so critical and important to our faith because of this very truth. Adam's seed is what passes on the sin marker to the rest of humanity. Yes, Eve made that decision first. But Adam followed, and it is through Adam that that sin nature is passed on, and that's why the virgin birth is so critical. If Jesus was born of a natural man, then sin nature would have been passed on to him. We've all been born with XX and XY chromosomes, one or the other. You weren't born with both, even though that seems to be confusing to people these days. But all of us were born with a spiritual marker that is spelled S-I-N. That marker is paved the way in our lives for problems and heartaches and difficulties. It's paved the way for rebellion and disobedience and sadness and sickness and wars and national disgrace, all because of that one infection. And so when you look around us and you wonder yourself, why did my friend treat me that way? S-I-N, sin. Why do people riot and steal? Sin. Why do nations war at one another? Sin. Why are there weeds in my garden? Sin. Why does my body hurt and grow old? Why does a snake crawl on its belly? Why does it hurt when I have a baby? Why is the world so messed up? Why do my relationships seem so hard to manage? And on and on and on we could go. The answer goes back to that spiritual marker that is on everyone's life. It's called sin. It really is that simple. In 1926, the Minnesota Crime Commission put out a report. It's quite lengthy. If you Google it, you'll see it's pages and pages and pages and pages. But they put out a report as to why things are the way they are. Why is crime increasing? And they came to this conclusion in their report, 1926, Minnesota Crime Commission, as to explain the rise of crime rate. They said this. Every baby starts life as a little savage. He's completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants, when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toys, his uncle's watch, whatever. Deny him these and he sees with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. 
This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, given free reign to the impulsive actions to satisfy each want, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, a rapist. Minnesota Crime Commission wrote that. 1926. You'll never hear a government agency these days give you the biblical reason for the mess that we're in. You're never going to hear that. They have all kinds of excuses, right? Reasons. But the truth is simple. It's called the total depravity of man. Adam's sin passed down to us and we are carrying out what comes naturally. Which simply means that it can't get any worse. Oh, the behavior gets worse. Maybe the in your face with the behavior, even though it's already in our heart, gets worse over time. But the condition cannot get worse. We're in deep. We are by nature children of wrath, and we're in trouble. We as a human race are infected with sin, and the wrath of God is on us, short of someone who could save us. Secondly, how does this happen? We need to understand, or why, is that if there is an opportunity to condemn all people through one man, listen, if there's an opportunity in God's economy, in God's justice, if there's an opportunity to condemn all men, through one man, because that sin nature was passed on to us and we therefore also sin. So we have to take ownership. We can't blame Adam. But if there's opportunity for that to happen in that way, it also paves the way for salvation for all people through one man. It paves the way for the opportunity that through one man, we actually might be able to remedy this situation because in Adam, we're all trouble. But in Jesus Christ, we who believe can be saved from that trouble. And that's who Paul talks about next in this passage. Just as one man's failure causes all of us to default to failure and death, one man's remedy brings about the opportunity for hope and life. Let's look at it, verse 15 to 21. He says, but the gift is not like the trespass. Man, I love that word right up front, but. But there's something different about the gift. And he makes it clear right at the beginning. This is so good. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by that grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Again, the gift, is, the, the gift of God is not like the rest, the result of one man's sin, The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, that's us, so also through the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you for taking care of a thing that I could not take care of. End of verse 14, he says here, if you go back just a second to the 14, he says that Adam is a type. He is the pattern of the one to come, this, this man, Jesus. And the thing we need to understand that they are only really similar in that each had the power to affect all of humanity. They are both represented humanity in their decision. They are not sing- similar really in any other way. Adam had one choice, one sin, one disobedience, caused a wave of condemnation for all, where in Jesus, one perfect life, one sacrifice, one act of obedience, caused a wave of freedom and acceptance into the throne room of God. That is the only way that they're similar, that they affected, one affected the whole. 
In theological classes, they call it the federal headship of Adam, the federal headship of Christ. It's one theory used to explain the imputation, how Adam's sin was imputed upon his descendants, how Christ's righteousness can be imputed upon those who believe in the gospel. It is not a biblical term, but one theory as to how sin and righteousness are passed on to humanity. We don't really have clarity on exactly how it works, but we know that that's what it says here in Romans chapter five. In 2012, the film The Hunger Games came out. Many of you have seen The Hunger Games and its sequels since then. But in The Hunger Games, Katniss Everdeen voluntarily takes her younger sister play, sister's place in something that was called The Hunger Games. It was a televised competition in which two teenagers from each of the 12 districts of Panam are chosen to, at random to fight to the death. Gladiator-type event that gives representation and representatives from each of the 12 districts a chance to fight to the end for their district. So if you win, your district, one out of the 12, would enjoy a year of freedom and food and peace until the next year when the Hunger Games would air again. And Katniss Everdeen, against all odds, fights and wins the games for her people. Her victory over death made all the difference in the lives of her family, her friends, and the people of District 12. She was the federal head, if you will, of District 12 in the Hunger Games. And Paul makes it very clear here that Jesus' offer of grace as a federal head to those of us who believe by faith is so much greater than is even needed. So much greater than is even needed. Verse 15, the gift is not like the trespass. Adam is not like Jesus. We're talking about two totally different persons resulting in two totally different results that are so vastly different, it's like comparing an ant to an elephant. And the thing about it is that the ant really did some damage. Major damage, not just on our hearts. The Bible talks about the world groaning, the, the vegetation groaning for redemption, even the vegetation around us, the fact that we have weeds in the garden and, and the, the, the fruit is not near as big that it's gonna be, I don't know if it's gonna be or not, but if you ever gone to Sight and Sounds, uh, you know, the beginning, that was amazing. You know, the fruit on the tree was like this in their depiction. I kind of like that, right? It's just not what it was supposed to be. And the ant Tremendous impact, but nothing compared to the elephant. Paul says over and over again that the gift is so much more than the trespass. It's not even in the same ballpark. It's like getting a treatment for heart disease. And it heals not only your heart, but it takes care of your cancer and your broken bones and your skin issues and your Alzheimer. It completely fixes your problem plus so much more. So much more. The effect of the gift is so much more potent than the effect of the trespass. Not only did Jesus counterpunch evil, he totally knocked it out. He totally knocked it out. Verse 15, how much more? Verse 17, how much more will we reign in life? Verse 20, if you sin without the law, just think how glaring your guilt is when you sin knowing the law. And that's the point of the law, right? It's, the, it's a schoolmaster pointing us to our need for Jesus and for this remedy. Because where sin increased, as we came face to face with our depravity and our sin because of the rules, we realize how terrible and how much we have sinned and have broken the rules of God. Jesus and his grace increased all the more in our lives. All the more. What is he practically saying to us this morning? He's saying this, sin cannot, pull, cannot put up a wall so high that grace can't go over it. And not just sort of get over it, but way, way, big wave over top of it, right? Sin cannot wreck a city so much that grace cannot fix it. Sin cannot ruin your life with bad stuff, so corrupt, so immoral that grace cannot meet it head on and eradicate it from your life. Some of you might be thinking, yeah, that's, that's great, Pastor Don, but you don't know me. You don't know me. You don't really know what's in my heart. You don't know what I've thought. You don't know how far I've gone in my sin. I, I just think I've gone too far. Paul's telling us right here, no, 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 no. Your sin has not outrun the grace of God. 
And where there is sin, any sin, God's grace abounds in an overflowing manner over it. He's demonstrated that even with Adam's sin, that inaugural sin. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and up to that point, everything was honky-dory. It was great. They saw, no, they saw no problems with anything around them, and then they sinned. They looked down and thought, uh-oh, we're naked. Where'd that come from, sin? They had a realization of the vulnerability and who they were. And so what did Jesus do? What did God do? He covered, they, what did they do, first of all, right? They tried to cover themselves with what? Fig leaves. Well, that's not going to last very long, is it? They dry up and crackle, right? It's not going to work. Ouch, right? But God comes along, right? He provides animal skins. In order to do that, he had to kill an animal. That sacrifice was the beginning of God's plan to recover, to cover sin with the shedding of innocent blood. Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. It started right there in the garden. And a principle is established right there in the garden that sin can only be paid for with a life. And he sacrificed the animals, and that life offered could serve as a substitute for the one who sinned. And there's a progression to that plan. You see it throughout history. I presume that because there were two people who sinned, he needed two skins for them, that he killed two animals, one for one. Later, the Passover is instituted with the Jewish people. You remember that the father was to provide a spotless lamb for the family. He was able to sacrifice, not one for one, but he could sacrifice a lamb for the sins of the family. And then later, as the tabernacle is built, the Day of Atonement is instituted, is now allowing one sacrifice for an entire nation. The priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sacrifice one animal for the entire nation. So we went from one for one, one per family, one to a nation. See how that happened? See what's going? And then John sees Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The world. He was our sacrifice. He was our substitute. Adam was our representative that proved to be deadly. Jesus is our representative that proves to be life-giving. There's great power in one man. There's power for evil and power for good. There's great power in one decision to eat of the forbidden tree and great power in the one decision that Jesus made to die for you and for me in obedience to the Father. And now it all comes down to the power of your decision to believe or not to believe. It's a very, very powerful decision that you have to make. Many of you have already made that decision. If you trusted Christ as your savior, that was the most important decision you'll ever make. It's the most powerful decision you have ever made in your life. And some of you are here this morning potentially and you've made a decision by not making a decision. You say, well, I'm not sure about all this stuff. Okay, fine. But guess what? You're still then an Adam. You're an Adam. And as an Adam, all die. It's very clear from verses 12 to 14. Adam began something that you and I can't stop. You and I couldn't do anything about it. We were born into it, like it or not. We follow up with the human nature and the sin nature in our life. We make decisions that are a front to a holy God, and we sin. That calls us to fall short of his glory, and we cannot enter into his heaven. Period. But because Jesus came and he died to take care of that infection, to provide the remedy so that you could be whole again and you could be healed from that, you have to make a decision to take that remedy. You have to make a decision to do that. You know, we just came through COVID. Are you tired of talking about that yet? All right, we came through COVID. And there was opportunity for you to get a vaccination to help you with the infection. Now, it doesn't really, the whole thing doesn't pan out perfectly in terms of picture because we realize you could still get COVID and all that kind of stuff. I get it. But you had to make a decision. Some of you decided to get the vaccination. 
help you. Some of you decide not to, and that's perfectly right, and that's great. Whatever you did, whatever. No judgment here one way or the other. But you had to decide that. The same is true for not your physical health, but for your eternal health, your eternal destiny, your eternity that you'll live. It'll either be down this road of destruction and death that Adam started, or I can choose to follow Jesus and trust him for what he did to take care of that infection that's in my life. And that's a powerful decision you have. Nobody else can make it for you. Your parents might have been strong believers. They can't make it for you. It is your decision alone. And you'll have to live with that decision. Eternally without God or eternally with him. You have to live with that decision. And so as we close our time this morning, I just want to encourage you. I want to pray for you. And I want to give you an opportunity, even the quietness of your own heart, to say, you know what? I, I get I'm on that, that road to destruction. I get it. I'm a sinner. Yeah, I messed up. I messed up. I'm be a good guy. I might be actually a pretty moral person. Somebody's directed me in good directions all my life. I've been pretty good. But you've got an infection. And today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to take care of that. Why live with that infection? Why live with that sin? Let's just, let's just let Jesus take care of it. He wants to do that in your life today. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for our time together. I want to just pause and give everyone an opportunity to just in their own quietness with their own heart. If there's anyone here today who has not made a decision to follow you, I pray, Lord, that today they might turn to you and trust you by faith. Just admit that they're a sinner. Turn to you and say, Jesus, I believe you are the son of God, that you are the spotless lamb that can take away this infection and this sin in my life. And so I trust you to do that. I want your remedy for me. And I trust you today and I follow you from here on out. Father, give me life abundant and free that you offer as a free gift, the gift that is so much greater there's so much more in this gift than the trespass even was bringing into my life. I have so much more that are mine, that's mine through the grace of God. And so I pray that you'll bring that into my life today. Father, I pray for anyone who may make that decision today that you will just flood their hearts with your spirit, help them understand and learn what it means to be a follower of Christ and be able to walk out of this place in freedom and in joy, free from the the reign of death that they're living in and now can walk in newness of life. Father, we love you. We thank you for your great gift. Thank you, Jesus, for your tremendous gift on the cross and the salvation that is offered to ours. Father, that brings us from death to life, from death to life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, would you consider going and subscribing and sharing? We hope that we can help everyone discover life change through Jesus. And again, for more information on Church of the Open Door, you can go to codyork.org. And you can also follow us on social media at codyork. Thanks again for listening.